And today we're going to look at Romans 12 and 1. I've, I neglected to tell you where to read at next week, or for, the, for today, but uh, in case I forget at the end of this message, for next week I want you to read Hebrews chapter 2 and Jeremiah chapter 2. Uh, in case I forget to tell you at the end of this message. But today we're going to read uh, beginning in Romans 12 and 1. And we want to look at the study of surrendering to God's plan. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now I want to, uh, you know, throughout the scriptures, you know, the, it's the, there's the call of the Holy Ghost on all of our lives, each and every one, uh, to all of us Christians, you know, that to submit to God. The Bible tells us in James, you know, submit uh, yourself or submit to God, yourself to God and resist the devil, then he'll flee from you. That's James four. And of course, then in our submission, our surrendering uh, to the plan of God, we discover in our life, as you and I surrender to God, things in our life that's not of God. And, and then it's in that area that God calls you and I to. It's, that's a place of repentance. That's a place that you and I have to take a hold of. And we've, we've said it through time and we will continue to say it that you can't know God unless you know only God. And see, So as we progress, as we submit to God, as we resist the devil, we discover a lot in our life that is not of God. And, and that's, that's that place that the Holy Ghost brings you and I to, to let us understand. You know that there's more force. There's something we have to take hold of. There's something that we're not complete in. And see, a sinner, uh, you know, we, we must be brought to the knowledge that, that he is a sinner. I, I have to be brought to the knowledge that I am coming short of the glory of God. I have to be brought to the knowledge that I'm a rebel against God. You know, and, that, and that's what is revealed to you and I as we submit ourselves to God. And I want to want us to notice something here in Romans 12 and 1 that that word beseech. And then we want to notice that Paul besought them by the mercies of God. And, and, that's, and, and that word beseech, we, we understand it as to call near, as an invitation to invite. But we want to notice the, 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 the terminology there that he besought them by the mercies of God. See, see why? You know, see, he besought them. So you, the letter here of Romans was written to the church. See, they was being invited, being called near by the mercies of God. And, and see, the mercies of God God was an invitation to them. It's in, in a presentation or presented to you and I, the mercies of God, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It's an invitation. See, He, he does not force this on anyone. He is beseeching them to, by the mercies of God. And He wasn't forcing them. It was an invitation to see why was God beseeching them? Why does He beseech you and I? You know, why don't the preachers, you know, quit harping on things like faithfulness? Why do the preachers keep on harping on things and, and, and preaching things, you know, that, 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 that always challenge my living? It's because of the mercies of God. See, He's beseeching you. He's letting you know that you're not submitting to God in something. See, when you, uh, a, a, a lady one time asked Pastor Clint Dennis, when you're going to preach, uh, quit preaching on a certain subject, he says when you start doing it. And see, and it's the mercies of God that's doing that for you and I. See, and 2 Peter 3 and 9 tells you and I, see, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And see, it's the mercies of God that, that's being presented to you and I. It's the power of God calling us. And then the Holy Ghost in this life is trying to prepare a bride for His Son. See, the Isaac the Son did not leave Abraham the Father's side, but the servant went out to find a bride for the Son. See, and that's the Holy Ghost in our life today. So see, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. You know, but he's long suffering to me. See, every one of us, or I'll just speak for myself. I would, I would just darken the gates of hell immediately if it wasn't for the mercies of God to, to overlook me and my folly, to overlook me and what I thought I knew was right, but actually I was totally wrong. And it was the mercies of God that was beseeching me. But all along the line, that, 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 that God's beseeching to you and I in our life, that invitation to call near, it's by His mercies that He's doing that, that you and I can come to a place to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And that is the plan of God in our life. And he see, He's wanting us to surrender to His plan. But see, when people, you know, they refuse to listen to the Bible. We refuse to listen to the counsels of God. We refuse to let the Word of God change us. And what they're doing, they're resisting 
the mercies of God and they're resisting the power of God. You know, and the Bible tells us, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that are ordained or are of God. And whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. See, notice that. If you, when you're resisting the power of God, you resist the ordinance of God. And that, and that is rebellion. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. But see, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. See, notice what that's saying here. See, you know, the, the rulers are not a terror of good works. So see, when the word is going out and the word is being preached, you know, the, the ones that are sitting back there standing against the word, resisting the word you know in our sitting there in our folly refusing to be changed by the word of god you know we are resisting the mercies of god and and just like verse 2 says we're going to receive to them ourselves damnation and wilt thou then not be afraid of the power do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same and see, so when, the, when these words are continually going out, when the, the messages are being preached and you find yourself, I wish you'd quit talking about that, I wish you'd hush, I wish you'd quit, I wish you'd move on. See, chances are you are resisting the power of God. You are rejecting the mercies of God. And I have to look in my life and understand, you know, what am I actually resisting? See the, the you know, the, it, it, see the people that are given to self, the self nature. Those are the people that reject mercy by their disobedience. See, so I, I said here, as the as the messages are being preached, as the pastors teach us, and, and you know, try to realign us, try to uh, tell me the good ways and the good knowledge of the Lord. You know, I'm sitting there rejecting mercy. Uh, it is actually what we're doing because He besought them in Romans 12 and 1 by the mercy of God, and that's that mercies of God that brings you and I to a place to surrender to God's plan, and that's present this body a living sacrifice. And see, Romans 2 and 4, Or uh, despisest thou the riches of His goodness, and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. See, and, and, and that's what He's doing to us all the time. He's leading you and I to a place to let you and I understand and discover in our life everything that's not of God. See, that that is the grace of God. That's the goodness of God. That's the forbearance and the long-suffering of God. And he, He's beseeching us all the time, that invitation to call near. You know, you know, I need you to do something. I need you to uh, conform. I need you to change. You know, so, you know, how many times in our life, how many times has God in my life, and you have Evaluate yourself that God has called us to do something or to be something, but we refuse to do it. You know, and Christ had that same issue in St. Luke when he was 13 and 34, and he said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. You know, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings? Yet ye would not. See, and, and, and see, how often has God tried to realign me, try to call me in, try to bring me back into the purpose of God, but I kill the man of God. You know, that's what the. And that's what I think it was Uzziah, one of the one of the men, uh, or no, it wasn't Uzziah. I can't remember, but anyway, he was one of them that 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 locked the seer into the prison because he did not like the counsels of God. See, and it was Asa. And see, and see when he when he was doing that. See, in my life, who in my life do I? When Pastor Eric or my dad preaches a message to me, do I lock myself, lock them in a prison, saying I will not hear, I will not, I refuse to be conformed, I don't agree with that. You know, and see, we're rejecting the mercy of God. See, He's trying to lead you and I to repentance. He's letting you know that, hey, I love you. I'm forbearing. I'm long-suffering. And the goodness of God is trying to lead me to repentance, but yet I refuse to, to, to repent. See, the rich young ruler was brought to a place of repentance, but he did not repent. See, Christ told him to go sell what you have, give unto the poor, and come and follow me. But then he went away sorrowfully. See, he was brought to a place of repentance, but he refused. See, it says, Cast away from you all your transgression whereby you've transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? And, that, and that, that question is presented to me today. You know, why will I die? You know, why am I committing a spiritual suicide by uh, resisting the Word of God? See, God was just telling him, you know, in Christ in the New Testament, well, how often, you know, I've sent prophets to you, I've sent people to you, and you hate them so bad, you say your father's Abraham, you say you love the Lord. 
but you kill the very people that represent the kingdom that you say you're a part of. See that that's the that is a rebellion in my life. You know, see that 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 question why why you know Jeremy why will you die? See so you know that and that's that's something that every one of us has to ask. You know, and that's the question that's still being presented to me today. You know, and presented to you and I. You know, why will you die? You know, the Lord is forbearing. He's long suffering. And the thing about forbearance, He never accepts you and I in our sin, but he, the, the, the forbearance is that He'll take you and I back just like the prodigal when we realize that we have come short of the glory of God, that we realize we're back in the hog pen of the world. See, uh, the whole time that Father, you know, and God in my, in the, the, my, my God is sitting there, and, and even when my sin, see, He's saying, you know, I still love that boy, but, you know, he, He's in sin. I'm not accepting what He's done, but if He'll just turn to me, you know, I'll accept Him back, you know, and I've made a provision for him you know that and that's the blood of christ so see that's the forbearance of god he doesn't accept sin but he's willing to take us back you know how often see what he had tried to gather that brood under the wing they they you, they get out of line he'd bring them back get out of line he'd bring them back he sent the prophets to him he sent ezekiel he sent jeremiah hosea all the prophets, all the men of God in the Old Testament, the Elijahs and Elishas, and yet, you know, they, they, they just would kill them, they'd run them off, they had, would despise them, had, had no part of what they wanted to do, and if it was a little part, they'd only have a little short revival, just to, so the mercies of God would be extended to them to you know, maybe bypass that generation just like Josiah, you know, he prayed, he turned to the Lord, and God looked at him when, the, when, they, when they went to the prophetess and they said that you know, she said that your eyes will not see this, but he died at a very early age, maybe around 39 or something. And then that judgment of God come upon that generation. But see, and it is still come, the judgment of God was still pronounced. But see, Josiah didn't see it because he turned his heart to God. See, the Lord is trying to get you and I just to realize, you know, that, hey, he's got more force. But as you and I serve God, you know, we'll find, you know, in my life that the wrong thought, the wrong motive is something that you and I have to be that has to be repented of. You know, we 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 so often time look outward. We we focus on the big sin. You know, we say big sin, little sin. But as you and I walk close to God, we'll understand more and more that He is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's when it really gets down. You know, of this inward man. See, He's really beginning to find. I mean, I can look the part, but I can be a Pharisee. You know, you know that that's something that we have to watch. You know, I could I love to have great shows and you know just pray in the corners you think oh he's a holy person but then i come and await the grievous burdens on you too heavy to be born and i myself are not willing you know to lift a finger to help you know so see anyone that's willing to give advice but not willing to do that advice is a hypocrite you know they're a pharisee you know, see, I could be that. But, you know, God is trying to bring... You know, he, he sees my motive. He sees my thought. And, and when that, that is wrong, He's trying to get me to repent of that. See, I've had to repent of a wrong motive and a wrong thought before. I, 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 I really begin to notice myself in some things. You know, why am I doing what am I doing? You know, what, what did I do that for? What did I say that for? You know, and if I was totally honest, it was because I got a little hint of something in my ear that I knew that someone had done. I thought I'd just throw that in for good measure but actually the Holy Ghost did not lead that thought or that word to be said, but it was just something that was preconceived. And see, the Lord, that has to be wrought with if I'm ever going to come to a place to love what God loves. And see, so surely, you know, what, what I've spoken here is evidence, you know, that the crisis hour that you and I are living. See, we, we're living in a time, you know, of, of, the, of the political uproar, you know, the social and economic things, the religious shakings. But see, God promised. He said that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But it's for the one purpose, that the only the things that cannot be shaken will remain. You know, there will be a people, you know, that God, that's going to stand up in this hour, you know, in, in, in the time when it's actually, see, we're not even really in, the, I mean, we, we're kind of being shook a little bit, but there's going to be something that's going to shake us to our very core. And when that, when that happens, people are going to be looking for an answer. And those only the things that remain will remain. And, and you and I, the only hope that we have is to submit to the mercies of God, to present this body a living sacrifice. That's what he's he, he just he's just telling us. You know, you know, I mean, it's my mercy. I'm beseeching you. I'm inviting you. I'm trying to get you to listen to me. So please do. So see the hour now. See we're we're coming to the time, and it's getting to it's getting late. You know, the ta the time now. 
It's for us to, to notice, you know, that we have to have a sound of, you know, of a change, a revelation. You know, in the church, you know, we, we spend too much time playing with surface issues. You know, things that really uh, don't matter. And I have to turn from my selfish thoughts, my selfish motives. I have to turn from man-centered attempts to promote things. You know, and, 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 and try to turn from the thought to let, instead of religion, serve me, but how I can serve God. You know, so I have to turn from the thought of always defending my doctrine. You know, if I always have to get up here and defend a stance of doctrine just saying, I'm a Baptist, I believe this, I'm a Pentecostal, and every time I get on the floor, I always give you the ten-step creed of what I believe. See, we have to get from things like that and turn to a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ and focus on the basic issues, the principles of faith, you know. And what is that? It's obedience to faith. It's, it's believing the Word of God, but doing the Word of God. So we have to deliberately in our life, you know, to non-conform, to be non-conformist to the system that's taken us. You know, Paul said there was a course of this world, you know, and we we have to resist that course. You know, there, Sister Francis Rose years ago, you say there's the tide is rolling, many's rolling with the tide. See, and that was people that was conforming to a world system, something that God that was not in, and something that God did not ordain. But see, we have to be conforming to the image of Christ. And we have to be a people that live by principles, the principles of faith. You know, so we, when you see the church, when they begin to resort, you know, to tactics in the effort to attract men, you know, what that tells us is that we've lost the war. When we begin to fight, when we begin to try to find ways other than Christ to attract people to the church, we've lost the war. See, we, and especially when we look at the church and we realize that we don't even have prayer meetings like we used to have. You know, we don't call people to fast, you know, the way we used to do. You know, we used to have prayer change, you no know, pray 24 hours around the clock. See, when you quit doing all that, you know, instead of focusing on Christ, we begin to turn to things. How can I attract people in? You know, how can I get a bigger name person here? Get the crowd up. You know, and we've we've left the principles of things that work. You know, and that and all that stems from prayer. You know, and, and that's something that. We have to know to see when, see when, when we lost the battle whenever the things become predominant issue. When the methodology has replaced the real message of Christ, you know, when we have lost touch with reality, we've lost this touch. When we begin to be more concerned about man, we become more concerned about the mission or the, mes the method instead of the message of Christ. See, we, we, we have to get back to the basics of principles of faith. And that's just simple obedience. You know, sometimes in life, you know, when you have, uh, you, you know, when you when you have mental patience, you know people sometimes that have mental issues and sometimes it or even when your heart gets a little out of rhythm or things you know they use electric shock you know to, to try to uh, break up old patterns to, to restore new patterns you know and that's what God is tries to do to you and I today that more the, the moral and the spiritual crisis you know that you know that's leading you out to the surrender to God's plan when, when we're beginning to surrender by the mercies of God that we present this body a living sacrifice he's trying to break up the old patterns of self-centeredness and shift you and I to a new center, you know, exposing ourselves to the, the shock treatment of God, you know, and, and that is allowing the Word of God to have free course in my life. And we've pointed out through the messages, throughout a lot of the message, you know, by man's own choosing, man become the center of his world and self became his God. And, and through and by that, we'll find how self is a very horrible thing to deal with. And it takes the shock treatment of the Word of God, you know, to blast us, you know, to move us, you know, from the false centers, you know, uh, you know, to try to try to move us, you know, from the things that I've that I think I believe because we know that the minister of God, you know, he, he is a, a minister to thee of good, you know. And as you and I uh, hear the Word of God, it's God trying to blast me off of my, my, my shallow foundation, the sand that I may be standing on. And he, in my experience, I may, be, I may have an experience. You know, I may experience a group. I may be uh, stuck on a, a theology. I may be stuck on a denomination. I may have an emphasis of a truth. I may have a, a, an emphasis on a spiritual person. I may put the emphasis on my work or a religious cause. But see, all those are marginal and even false sinners if Christ is not that sinner. See, there's a lot of spokes to this wheel. But see, Christ is always the sinner. And everything that I deem in my life as holiness, everything that I deem in my life as important, you know, it, the, the only holiness I have is how I'm subject to the Holy Ghost. And, that, and that's all that is. And anything that stems uh, other from... Uh, 
anything other than from the center of Christ through and by the leadership of the Holy Ghost conforming me to the image of Christ by the Word of God is a false center. You know, there could be, like I said, a truth. There could be an emphasis on a truth. You know, but, but there's something called the truth, you know, and, that, and that's Christ. And it disturbs religious people. It disturbs us when we're challenged, you know, by the thought that, hey, I, I, he's trying to move me from what I've always believed. And it disturbs, you know, it disturbs, you know, that, that, that we know, you know, Christianity because the sinners of what I used to observe, the sinners that you and I used to observe. It could be churches, organizations. You know, a lot of things have been built on things other than Christ. And some, you know, some churches, I grew up in this, you know, that, that the whole thought was always sanctification. And it was the whole reason that that church even come to existence. You know, we've got to preach it just a little closer. So we've got to stem off and make this whole uh, sanctification thing, the 10 step guide of being uh, and, and fitting my, my mold, you know. So that center was sanctification. But see, the problem with that person thinking that the center was sanctification is that they never recognize that sanctification is a person. It's not a thing. Because 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, and notice this, who of God is made unto us, you, me, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. See, so the person, sanctification. So see, so you grow up sometimes, it's real easy to get real legalistic real quick. And see, what happens is, is when you begin to uh, focus and turn away from Christ being the center, it's real easy to begin to add a little bit to the Word of God. You know, you, you come to to a truth and you get a little gun hole in something, you know, then you think, man, this is it. I want to establish this. I'm going to preach this as a doctrine. But see, we always have to remember the author and the finisher of our faith is Jesus Christ. And see, so the first uh, uh, shock treatment that you and I may receive, it says, make no appeal for the man to come to God, you know, in order to be happy and to be blessed. We have to let people know that we have to be adjusted to the purpose that God has called you and I. See, so see, so oftentimes the primary theme, you know, of the churches is just, you know, come in, you know, the Lord loves you, of course He does, but you, when we make an appeal to man that God is only for your happiness, God is only for you to be blessed, and see, we've taken the, we have taken the blessedness of God, being blessed of God, and made it monetary. We always see dollar signs rolling our eyes when the Lord comes up and prophesies a little something to to us, we automatically think, oh, he's going to make me a millionaire. He, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have that. But you know, when you go to these uh, uh, lesser countries, third and second world countries, and even talk to people that truly have the joy of salvation in their heart, they know that the blessedness of God is joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. See, we, we invert values. And that's what the, the church in the United States has done so quickly. It's easy for me to do that, is to have an inverted value to think that the blessedness of God is to, solely monetary. You know, of course we know Solomon says money answers all things, but we invert our values by thinking that is the blessing of God. You know, what, whatever happened to praying... You know, the things that God wants you and I to have instead of praying for what I want. See, the Bible tells you and I what to pray for. But if you notice in your prayer life, if you don't center your prayer life around the things that God tells you to add to, you know, and that God tells you to pray for, we, we, we turn ourselves to a self-centered prayer. We spend our time, Lord, you know, I want this, Lord, I want that. But, you know, we need to pray, Lord, give me joy and peace and righteousness. Lord, help me add to my faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance, you know, the temperance patience and the godliness and brotherly kindness and the charity, you know, which is the bond of perfectness. You know, and then Lord, help me to make my calling and election sure, as Peter would tell us. You know, and he, and he tells us if we do that, we'd be, be neither be barren nor unfruitful or we'll never fall. See, pray for the things that God wants you to have instead of praying of what you want to have. See, that, that, that's the difference between a centered prayer of the will of God and a self-centered prayer. You know, see, so we make the the, the statement in, our, you know, in the church sometime until we can come back. You know, until the church can come back and recognize the principle behind the church, the purpose of the church, what it is to accomplish for God. You know, we're going to continue to to just to, to live where we live at. We're going to continue man-made things, man-operated things that we call the church. We have to recognize. You know, until we recognize that we are created for the purpose of God. You know, in, you know, in our being. We will never fulfill the purpose. 
And we have to first recognize that we are not here to fill our own will and our own purpose, but we are here to fill and do the will of God. That's what Christ said. I have come to do Thy will, O God. And everything in the Word of God. See, remember the first me- the first verse I said. He says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I'm inviting you by the mercies of God." That's the reason why he- he's telling us is it's by the mercies of God that He's wanting you and I to fulfill our purpose. You know, He's wanting us to let- surrender to God's plan to let- present this body a living sacrifice. See, Paul prayed to the-, the Ephesian church when he says, "You know, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened." that ye may know what is the hope of His calling in us. See, my eyes of understanding have to be open. I have to know what. Notice that what is the hope of His calling? That's an uppercase. Uh, that's an uppercase H. That means Christ calling in us. So, what is the calling in us? See, and I have to let my eyes be enlightened. I have to understand. You know what God is intended for me. So see, the first intention is not to turn our attentions to man's problem, not to my problem, but I have to turn my eyes to God Himself so that my eyes can begin to be understand and begin to be enlightened in the things of God. And in here is where repentance really begins. When I recognize that I've run off the wrong, one of the trails of religion, when I recognize that maybe I've missed the purpose in my life a little bit, I begin to run off and uh, begin to focus on a truth instead of the truth. And see, it does, and it's just not a matter of saying, oops, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. You know, we have to come to a place and say that, but we have to repent. That means we have to turn aside. We have to make straight paths for our feet, go back the other way. You know, that means we have to turn back to God. It just, you know, we have to make reconciliation we have to get things back right with God you know and you know believers may not realize it but even as believers you know in this room today in Jeremy and in my life I'm either centered in man or I'm centered in God you know that that's the choices of life you know that is the test of life you know that was the test of the first Adam you know he failed but the test of the second Adam who was made a quickening spirit he prevailed in that and that's what lives in you and I but that is the test that you and I face every day every test every temptation that you and I face, just like the children of Israel, it was going to let me know if whether I'm going to be, remain as a self-centered person or am I going to be centered in God and let God be my center. See, there is no alternative. See, we, we create gray areas, but when you when the thoughts, the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, see, I've been brought to realization that I've been a very self-centered person in times past. And I'm sure that the Lord is going to show me that I'm not right in something even today. Day. But see, we, we have to walk in this light as He's in this light. See, the blood keeps you and I in fellowship, we, even with the thought of God looking at me, knowing that I'm not quite right in something, but I don't know that yet. But see, but there's no alternative. See, God is either the center of my life, and we, you know, and we have become adjusted to Him, adjusted to His purpose, or I have made myself the center of my world. And see, so we we want throughout these lessons, throughout the messages that we teach, we want to consider and look at the unfolding of God's ultimate purpose in my life. That it's progressive, it's unfolding. You see, so the Lord can show me something today that I'm self-centered in. And He brought me to that place so I can repent of that. But you know, through and by the process of time, He's going to show me something else. It's progressive. You know, we're, we're changed image to image, glory to glory. You know, and, and that's and that's what the Lord is trying to do for you and I today. You know, we want to recognize, realign ourselves to God's purpose for us in our life and not man's purpose. And see, so see, as we look from from the external, as you and I look at the eternal view of what the church is, we want to discern and look at three major faults, you know, that happens to people in the church, you know, from from the outside looking in. We want to notice a few things here. First of all, because we because people start from the wrong point, they develop a false point of reference. So see, when you when you come into the church. 
and we're teaching people something other than the oracles of God, especially a young Christian. They're so easy to be molded sometimes. And so easy to, especially if they have confidence in a man and not in Christ, they'll believe a lot of what you have to tell them. So see, if, if my conversation is not holy, if I'm not holy in all manner of conversation, that is to represent this word totally and holy how God would have it represented, I give people a false point of reference. And see, by doing that, second, so that false point of reference, I never can really get back to what God would have in view for me until I totally let Him tear down and destroy, you know, and form me the way He wants me. I can never get back to, I mean, never realign to the purpose of God until I let the Lord form me and totally change what I am. Secondly, because we take the past, our past experience, you know, the things that God has showed us in the past, you know, so oftentimes we take that as the whole that we develop a real fatal nearsightedness. You know, there's people that, you know, as Juan Nees and Juan Brees withstood Moses, there's people in the church that you try to elaborate to in the more excellent way of understanding, try to explain to them a little something that the Word totally says, but just because they have been raised in a folly, you know, they have taken the experience that they had. Well, we used to shout for two hours straight. You know, we, we We've done this, we've done that. They took the past as a whole. You know, that they said this is all that God is, and I believe this is all that God is, and by doing that, they've developed a fatal nearsightedness, and through and by the process of time, that person will backslide or that person will fall. You know, and it just it just happens. You know, they'll they'll become a degenerate person. They'll they'll become one that's totally useless to the kingdom of God. And see, third, because we start wrong, you know, our procedures are wrong, what we do is wrong, then our progress is off course. See, so you and I can start from the same point. You know, Eric and I can start from Red Lake and I can say, okay, we're going to go around the world. But see, if, if he don't, if I start at a zero and he starts two degrees off, by the time we get back to what should be our starting point, he's going to be a thousand miles to the north. See, because we started wrong, everything that you and I do, the more we progress, we get further and further off course. But see, so since this fall that we talk so much about, that's made man central, you know, we, we, when we begin to listen to the theology of so many, much of our churches and our messages, if we're not careful, we, we discover that so much of the center of that is focus is on the man, the man himself. You know, even the songs we sing. You know, a lot of times if you... I believe in singing songs of theology. You know, so, so often times if we're not careful, we see songs, sing them that don't even have Christ's name mentioned one time. You don't hear nothing of the blood, nothing of the Spirit. We, do, we just... We just sang a sophistication. We sang something that's pretty, and I'm not calling the death everything, but we know that there we, we have to recognize what is man centered and what is Christ centered. You know, and so see when we and we want to focus and notice that if my mindset is only to come, you know, let God bless you. You know, come in, let's have a time. You know, come in. You know, if you desire to be rich, if you desire to be happy, if you want to be uh, blissful, and some will even admit, they'll say that, you know, that's what the church is for. You know, who else is important to, to God but man? You know, but, you know, you, we, we, we don't want to be a self centered person. We want to recognize that we are here for a purpose. And see, remember, beseech you by the mercies of God. See, God is wanting you and I to surrender to His will. And that, that will is that this body is a living sacrifice. So see, the, the, see we, we begin to wonder. We, we say, man, why is not the church uh, come to maturity as God is intended? You know, why, why aren't we mature? Why aren't we doing the things that the book of Acts has promised us? The reason is that there's something in my life that's still man-centered. There's something that I've not let the Lord totally deal with yet. And see, the, so the secret of realizing God's ultimate purpose... You know, it is we we is to be found in the correction of our starting point. We have to get back. We have to go back. You know, go back to Bethel. You know, go back to the house of God. Recognize. You know, through and by the Word of God, where I've come short, maybe where I've not uh, done all I need to do, and let's let's come back to the altar of prayer and let's repent and saying, Lord, this is my new starting point. Lord, I've I've not been as faithful as I ought to be. Maybe, Lord, I've come a little short. And see, remember, see, it's His forbearance, His long suffering that leads you and I to repentance. But we 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 must make the choice to repent. I I don't want to be like that rich young ruler and go away sorrowfully, knowing you know. Just think about that. He has eternity. 
you know, to, re- to recognize that Christ come to him with the message and he has an eternity to regret, you know, that he said no. And, and that's what's going to make hell so horrible, among other things, but other than just burning forever in a lake of fire, that we're going to sit there and realize that, man, I've had a chance. Why didn't I listen? You know, and that's what's going to make hell, hell, you know, because we, we're going to realize that that provision was being made. We're going to see, you know, just like Lazarus and the rich man looked over and saw him in Abraham's bosom, you know, we're going to look across that great gulf and realize and say, man, I don't have to be here. Christ shed His blood for me, but yet I refuse to listen. You know, Jeremiah recognized that when he said, you know, in some of the Scriptures when he said, you know, he tried to tell them they refused and they would not hear. You know, they refused. You know, and and that's to reject the mercies of God. And I don't want to be that person. So this morning, you know, we, we must return to God. And, I, and, and, that is, and that is if you've totally slid back on something, backslid, you return to God. But even in your life, let's return to God in my motive, in my intent, in, in that heart. You know, let, let's let the Lord deal with me. He's dealt with me very harshly and very straightforward in things because my motives have been wrong. See, the Lord will refine you and, and, he'll, even, and he'll even correct you. Sometimes people think... I. I mean, I, I do talk and I'm friendly sometimes. And I try to be friendly, but the Lord just sits there and tells me, uh, and he, he tries to deal with me not saying too much. You know, let your ABA, your Navy, nay, especially at work, you know, they, they, they sometimes they wonder why I don't talk too much, you know. But see, anything other than yay and nay and nay and nay, you know, comes a lot of other things, you know. So we, we've got to be a person to let the Lord form us and, and make a little something out of us. And I ain't talking about sticking your head in a sack and not talking to nobody, but you will have a holy conversation. And the things that you speak will be concerning the oracles of God. See, when I speak, when people hear me speak, I want them to know that, hey, you know, Jeremy has a little something to say. He, he's not a blowhard or he's not just windbagging again. He's not telling another big joke or being funny. You know, and, and, and that, that's what we want to have the reputation to be is that, hey, when they speak, what they say says matters. You know, when that person says something, I know it's the truth. You know, if you're in an occupational field, there can be one thing happen and there can be 20 different accounts of the same thing. So that means 19 people are lying. You know, so see, and, and, that, and that's just the way it is, you know, so in, in the workplace and stuff. And so you want to have a reputation when you stand there that people can look and say, well, if Jeremy said it, I know that it's right. You know, and, and we ever want to room want to be that. So anyway, so see the first work of the Holy Ghost is to present the object. And what is that object? See, when Christ, when God looked at Jesus in Matthew 3 and 17, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So see, God is not pleased in nothing else except His beloved Son. So see, God did not present man he presented his son as the object and the starting point. See, notice, he says, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It's only as I'm conformed to that image, it's only as God sees the blood, you know, that, that he had passed over me. It's only in Christ that he is pleased. And it's only in Christ in me that God is pleased. So that, that's in our life. So see, I must correct the starting point. If I'm ever going to arrive to the right place, see, remember, it's His beloved Son whom He's pleased. If I've got a false center, if I've recognized in my life that I've not been centered in Christ, but centered in a uh, an experience rather than experience in a li- uh, having experience in life, if I'm centered in something other than Jesus Christ, if I recognize that my course is a little bit off, you know, let let's revert back, let's redo our first works, let's repent, and let's get the starting point back to my beloved. Son in whom I'm well pleased. That's the object. That's Christ. So we must correct this if we're ever going to arrive to the right place. If, I, if I'm ever going to get to where God wants me to get, I have to start right, but we have to end right. So we must come back, return to God, and look through the eyes of the eternal God. Look through myself and look at the world through the Word of God the way God has intended it for you and I to look at it. And I know this is a heavy message this morning, but I want us to recognize, you know, especially you know, in my life, you know, am I self-centered or am I God-centered? That's a question we have to ask. You know, we, we, we face that every day. I mean, when we wake up and our, we face the old enemy of our prayer life, we face the old enemy of our pocketbook, you know, we face the enemy of of, of harbor and hatred or we face the enemy of selfishness you know what whatever the works of the flesh are we all have stuff to deal with you know you I mean and that's just that's just what we are I mean we we may not deal with the same sin 
But we deal with the sin. You know, see, and, and of course, the sin is that man is self-centered. It manifests itself. It may manifest me through greed and lust. It may manifest through Eric and hatred and variance. It may, uh, uh, you know, manifest itself through Mike over here and tailbearing or something. But still, all of that is the is the sin, which is self-centeredness, which manifests itself in different ways. So, see, we're we're all in the same boat here. I mean, it just no matter what you're uh, guilty. Of you know we're just like uh, Romans. I want to read this. I feel I want to read something here. Uh, Romans chapter two. Oh, in verse three it says, "Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same? Thou shalt escape the judgment of God." So see, I can judge you for your gossip, or I can judge you for thinking that you need to repent, or I can judge you for this. And what 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 the manifestation of this is? If you're in a, a church service. And the preacher's preaching, and the whole time that preacher's preaching, say for instance he's preaching on a tear, and you're just sitting there thinking, oh, I know who that's a going to, and you spend your whole time thinking that, see, you have become a judge of evil thoughts. See, you, you have not let the Word mold you and form you. See, you're the tear because you're sitting there judging, and you're thinking you're going to escape the judgment of God by thinking you know who that message is going to, and the whole time you're just sitting there on your little eagle's nest saying, I know that's not me, and just judging that person the whole time. And I ain't calling the death what discernment is, but I want you to recognize if you spend the whole sermon saying that I know who that's going to, you've totally not realized the purpose of the Word of God. It's for reproof and for correction and holiness and in me. You know, in me. I mean, I have to look in the mirror and recognize self. So see, you can, you can take that for what I said, but the Lord let me know that yesterday or maybe the day before uh, about that. So I wanted to share that with you. And see, so... When we look at, see, when man, in his fall, when he become his own sinner, see, from that time until now, self has been the sinner of the fallen man. And see, what was true of man is true of the church. See, ultimately, as the church loses out with God, as we begin to lose our, our starting point, as we begin to be unfaithful in things that God has called us to do, see, man becomes the center of the focus. We, we always try to add to something else other than getting back to the basics, the principles of faith. And see, when you notice in the first book of Romans, see the last 11 verses, see there was very graphic language, you know, talking uh, to that Roman church. And so, see, from Romans 1 and 1 to the end of that book, see, the, from a believer to a reprobate in 11 short verses. And how did that happen? It's because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. See, as you and I know God, but we serve self instead of serving God, you become a believer then to a reprobate. That's what happened in Romans 1. See, then God gave them up to that unclean spirit. And what is that unclean spirit? See, they sacrificed God for man. See, man began to glorify the creature more than the Creator. And that unclean spirit is a spirit of self. It is willfulness. It's iniquity. It's selfishness. It's all involved in the uncleanliness. See, God gave them up to their self-centeredness. And you notice what happens. See, when man and women become to uh, return and no longer be, was part of their natural use, you know, but they turned to that which, you know, it was a downward. It was progressively downward. See, the homosexuality, the reprobate mind, you know, that was the judgment of God because they turned, you know, from a God-centered, a believer, to a reprobate, all because they did not retain God in their knowledge. You know, and that is, you know, in my folly. If God, if I don't retain God, if I don't let this Word be the author and the finisher of what I believe, you know, it's a, it's a very, very good uh, recipe for a, being a self-centered person. So see, the big problem of the church in the end time is that we've, we've never come to this maturity because we're still centered in man. In, in her thinking, God exists for one purpose, and that is to bless man. See, that's what I said. We don't want to think that the blessedness of God is always monetary. You know, we don't want to just number Israel every time. We want to get in here and, 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 and preach the messages of God. We want to reach out. 
We want to go to Samaria. We want to go out and, and do the works of God. But before I can do that, I first have to be full myself. You know, we, we have to be filled with something. We have to have this life before we can teach this life. And we have to have this life before we can share this life. And it's as God deals with me. You know, like Josh Hamby said the other day, when that, that gentleman, when he used to pray and he'd draw that circle around him, he says, Lord, deal with this man in this circle before I deal with those out there. And that that's what I have to do. I, I mean, my, my Myself, you know, every one of us in this room, surely we could admit that our self is a big problem. We have to battle it all the time, you know, and if you don't pray and if you don't keep the old man mortified, you know, he'll he'll sure come back and cause you a lot of problems. But see, man did not create God, God created the man. And the Bible says he created man for his pleasure, not our pleasure. You know, see, so as we come to live in His pleasure, we find our greatest pleasure. And that's to serve the Lord. See, God gives the delight of our heart when we set our affections upon Him. See, seek ye first the kingdom of God, heaven, His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. See, when our whole purpose is, uh, a life is centered in God, you know, where every choice we make is questioned as to being the will of God. See, we, we have to pray, you know, does God want, you know, let's, let's walk in the will of God. You know, we don't want to walk around as basket cases and praying if we should buy a blueberry muffin or a strawberry. We don't want to buy, I mean, we don't, you don't want to just be ignorant about it, but we want to just let God be our leader. You know, He'll lead us and guide us in all truth. You know, so see, at all times and all places, you know, we want to be settled on one thing, and that's to please God. You know, Psalms 37 and 4, and it says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. But see, me, Jeremy and his self-centeredness corrupts that. See, I don't delight myself in the Lord, I delight myself in man. And the manifestation of that is, see, man and his self-centeredness corrupted that message that David wrote by making the desire of his heart things. We've made the desire of our heart substance. And that, that is always the symptom of what the Bible calls the world, worldliness. It was materialistic, and what it is, it's the thinking where, where men's, you know, men's, our greatest fear is poverty and suffering. You know, and, and that, that is the world that God said is His enemy. See, we cannot serve God in mammon. See, man would turn the desires of his heart uh, is from God, and we've, we've turned it to things. So see, we've not delighted ourselves in the Lord, but the Bible says to delight ourselves in the Lord. See, so God must become the center of my desire. He must become my center of what I'm doing, of His will, and God's wants, I mean, my wants have to be God's wants. See, and, and see, the model prayer, we know what the model prayer is. He says, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, see when He says it was only... Only then when he could pray, give me this day our daily bread. See, when he, when he, when he, when he prayed that, you had to say, Thy kingdom come. It was, it, was, it was the steps of prayer. It just study the Lord's prayer for what it actually tells us. You know, so we must recognize, you know, that I've become the center, you know, uh, of my world. You know, and, and I must recognize that for re repentance to be truly genuine. See, remember the start of my message. See, we're being besought by the mercies of God. See, that's why the messages are going forth. That's why the, the, the pastors are preaching and teaching so, so uh, forcefully and strictly on commitment and, and, and just the basic things of God. See, you, you would, I mean, it's so hard sometimes to get people committed, but see, it's the mercies of God that that message keeps on going forth. See, some people just get mad and leave. I'm tired of hearing that. I mean, I don't have to pray. I don't know why they say I have to. But see, you, we've rejected the mercies of God with that mindset. But we don't want to do that because we'll have eternity to regret resisting the mercies of God. See, 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 repentance brings you and I to this place, to you and I to see sin as God sees sin. So see, with repentance... We, we, we know that we don't, we are not only see sin as horrible, but we see sin how God sees sin. So see today, you know, don't, don't reject the mercies of God. See, we're being beseeched. We're being besought. See, we have the invitation to be called near. He's saying, you know, and it's by the mercies of God that He's doing this. See, so I want us to recognize that the, see, that, that the, the, his forbearance, his long suffering. See that knowing that you and I should know that the goodness of God is trying to lead you and I to repentance, and, that, and that's doing that, that's leading you and I to a place that we surrender to the plan of God, and that we discover in our life the things that are not of God. 
And He's doing that because He loves us. You know, we don't want to spend... You know, if, 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 if people went to hell, and if we knew that hell was just as long as however long it would take a teaspoon to dip out the Pacific Ocean, you would have hope. But you don't even have that. See, think about it. You, you would have billions of years thinking, man, as soon as that man gets that ocean dipped out that teaspoon, I'll get out of here. But you don't even have that. You see, that this, this is life and death. And it's by the mercies of God that He's extending this invitation. Present your body this living sacrifice.